Hello everybody, this is Mike Cooper at Calvary Chapel Davao and we're continuing in our Wednesday Bible study. Um, last week we finished up Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and today we'll be going through chapters 4 and 5. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord. Once again we can come together here and we're online Lord, but it doesn't matter to you. Uh, you can bless us anyway, we know that, and we pray that you'll join us here, Lord, that you'll give us blessings, Lord, give us understanding and discernment for your word, and help us, Lord, to um, take these words and use them in our life, Lord, to make changes, to really dwell in your word, to dwell in your love, Lord, and, and the things that you have prepared for us that you've already prepared for our lives, that if we just follow these things, Lord, we'll be happy, we'll have a joyful life throughout our lives. So we thank you for this time and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, chapters four and five, <clears throat> excuse me. In Ecclesiastes four and five, the ancient searcher here of Israel answers a question that all of us have asked at one time or another in our lives. Whenever a tragic circumstance occurs or a terrible injustice is revealed, everyone is sure to remark, and I've heard this myself, you say your God is a God of love, but how could a God of love allow such a thing to happen? You've probably even heard this question asked. How could a God of love last, let 10 innocent people be murdered by a gunman who goes into a supermarket and starts shooting at random? Or how could a God of love allow the murder of unarmed men, women, and children in refugee camps in Syria? Sometimes the question is more personal. How can you say God loves me when he lets me work with my fingers to the bone and allows other people to have inherited wealth and spend day, their days enjoying themselves. In chapter three, the searcher declared that God has a wonderful plan for each life. There is a time for everything, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to weep, and a time to laugh. Through that list of opposites, he declared that God has a perfect plan that includes what we need, the painful as well as the pleasant. If we accept those as God's choices for us, coming from his loving heart, not out of anger, not out of desire to punish, but out of love, we'll discover three wonderful things. First, we'll be enabled to enjoy all of life, even the painful circumstances. Secondly, we'll learn how to know God. In 1 John 5.20 it says, We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. We'll satisfy the sense of eternity which God has put into each heart. That will happen when our attitude towards life changes because of our relationship with Him. Thirdly, this lesson will be repeated for us until we learn it, until we get it right. You know, there followed immediately four frequently voiced objections that appear to contradict this idea that God has a wonderful plan for each life. We looked at the first last week the presence of injustice in a place where justice ought to be found, the courts and the judicial, judicial systems of our land. We often hear about some person who has spent five years in jail for another person's crime, wrongfully accused and convicted. When a mistake like this is finally discovered, he is freed from prison but given absolutely nothing and recompense for his time in jail. This kind of injustice raises the question, what do you mean God has a perfect plan for our lives? 
How can you square that with a statement with such an unjust circumstances? The searcher here has two answers to that. First, we have to remember that the final recompense lies ahead. God has appointed a time while he will bring to light all of the hidden things and straighten them out. And second, even injustice teaches us something of great value. It reveals to us our own beastliness. We share with the animals a beastly quality which injustice will bring out. And, like the animals, we have a temporary existence here. In chapter 4, the searcher now discusses the remaining three objections to the idea that God has a wonderful plan for our life. First, he addresses the objection we have already referred to, oppression and society, in verses 1 through 3. It says, again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared to the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. You know, every one of us could probably list a similar circumstance of oppression in our lives. Oppression almost always preys on the helpless, the weak, and the infirm, the people that can't defend themselves, but it also happens to us in some ways. None of us go through life without feeling oppressed in some way, at some time. The searcher knows this. Notice how he records the anguish, the misery that it causes. He speaks of the tears of the oppressed, the weeping, the sorrow, and the brokenness which the oppressed feel over something they can do nothing about. Then he twice categorizes the awful sense of the helplessness for, that comes from the oppression. There is no one to comfort the oppressed in a world filled with this kind of thing. The hopeless and the helpless ask, who can we turn to? Where can we go for deliverance? You know, they sometimes feel that death would be preferable to what they are going through that even, they even come to the point where they wish they had never been born. Job felt that way. Love the day, let the day perish wherein I was born in Job 3.3. 3. And he also said in that same verse, why did I not die at birth? <clears throat> How do you square that? with the declaration that God has a wonderful plan for your life. How can you say that to someone who is being oppressed? The searcher doesn't attempt to answer that for the moment. First, he looks at another objection in verses 4 through 11. The idea that rather than enjoyment being man's great motivation, motivating passion, envy, and ambition really are the driving force behind his activity. In verse 4, And I saw all the toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing of the wind. How accurately this records of what's happening in human history. You know, people don't really want things. They want to be admired for the things that they have. What they want is not the new car itself, but to hear the neighbors say how lucky you are to have such a beautiful car. That's what people want. That's the center. That's the focus of attention. I read a magazine article not long ago by a reporter in, it was concerning life in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> it was concerning the politicians there and how they were living. And here is what she says. 
motivates people in the U.S. Capitol. And I don't imagine it's much different here. She says, ambition is the raving and insatiable beast that most demands to be fed in this town. The setting is less likely to be some posh restaurant or glitzy nightclub than a wholly unremarkable glass office building or an inner sanctum somewhere in a federal complex. The reward in the transa transaction is frequently not currency at all, but power and ego massage. For this, the whole agglomeration of psychological payoffs, there are people who will sell out almost anything, including their self-respect, if any, and well-being, and the well-being of thousands of others. That's sad. That's saying exactly what this ancient searcher is saying. The drive to be admired is the true objective of life. But he says this too, is vanity and chasing after the wind. But sometimes when people become aware of this, they flip over to the opposite extreme. They drop out of society. They get out of the rat race. They go on relief and let the government support them. We've seen a lot of that kind of reaction in different parts of the world in recent years. Young people, particularly, have been saying, we don't want to be a part of the rat race anymore. We don't want to strive to be admired. We'll drop out of society. But that's not the answer either. The searcher says in verse 5, fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. You know, many young people who were part of the youth revelation, the counterculture society of a few years ago, the hippie movement was one. I found this to be true. That when you sit in idleness, you devour yourself. Your resources disappear. Your self-respect vanishes. They had to learn the painful lesson that the only way to maintain themselves, even physically, let alone psychologically, was to go to work and stop devouring themselves. You want know, to be much better, says the searcher, to lower your expectations and choose a less ambitious lifestyle. Like it says in verse 6, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls of toil and chasing after the wind. Yet he says, so powerful is ambition and the desire to be envied that men actually keep working and toiling even when they have no one to leave their riches to. In verses 7 through 8, it says, Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had no son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were content with his wealth. Were not content with his wealth, excuse me. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless. So how true that is. You know, some people keep on toiling even though they have no one or nothing to work for and nothing to do with the money that they make. They even deny themselves the pleasures of life in order to keep laying up funds for themselves. A sharp example of this story is of the billionaire Howard Hughes. He didn't know what to do with his money. He had so much of it. His heirs, whom nobody can even identify for certain, were left to squabble over it. This rich guy had many wives and lovers during his lifetime and children with them all, secretly with many, so they spent years in court squabbling over the money and who deserves this and who deserves that. Somehow, in all of his tragic existence, he never seemed to ask himself, why am I doing this? What's life all about? Why am I amassing tremendous amounts of money when I don't even spend a dime on myself? That is what the is saying here. In contrast, the searcher admits that companionship is better than loneliness in verses 9 through 12. 
where it says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls oh, and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? You know, though one may have overpowered, two can defend themselves. One can be overpowered, but two can defend themselves better. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now you might say it's true that men work out of a sense of ambition and drive for admiration for others, but it's better than to have companionship while doing it. The searcher agrees to this and lists four advantages to it. First, it will increase the reward. Two really can live cheaper than one. A lot of people get married for this basis. During the Depression, there was a popular song that said, potatoes are cheaper, tomatoes are cheaper. Now's the time to fall in love. Many young people agreed with that and got married, but economics have changed today, haven't they? Today, rice and potatoes are dear. Tomatoes are dear, but still, now is the time to fall in love because you can combine your resources. Secondly, he says, a friend will provide help in time of trouble. If you get into difficulty, your friend or roommate will be there to help you. You know, you have to have grown up in Montana to really appreciate the third advantage here. When the temperature gets down to 40 below zero outside, that's Fahrenheit. Do you understand that the searcher means when he says, if two lie together, they are warm, but how can one be warm alone? That doesn't really exist here in the Philippines, does it? We're usually trying to stay cool. Fourthly, the presence of another or more than, than one another in your life makes defeat unlikely. A man might prevail against one or two, but two, uh, against one, but two will stand with them. A threefold of cord, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. While there are advantages in companionship, the searcher's argument is that it still adds up to emptiness. It doesn't satisfy the sense of eternity that God has put into men's hearts. Many couples sit in loneliness, staring at the television screen for hours at a time, or seek some other diversion to fill the emptiness and misery in their lives. Computer games and TikTok. So companionship, though better than loneliness, isn't the answer either. A final objection is raised in the latter part of chapter 4. This says in effect that living a life, a long life, doesn't always guarantee that one will learn the secrets of enjoyment. What is the searcher has been saying? And it's real simple. is that God has a perfect plan and he will teach you as you go. If you live long enough and listen carefully, you will learn that enjoyment is a gift from God. But now comes the argument that people who live a long time still don't seem to learn. In verses 13 through 14, Better a poor but wise youth than an old foolish king who no longer knows how to heed a warning. The youth may have come from prison into kingship, or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. You know, a wise youth is better than an old foolish king who had put opportunities that was handed to him. Yet age can make one headstrong and fanatical, convinced that everything he wants to do is right. Even living a long time doesn't teach us all the lessons. You know, I personally learn that almost daily. But a long life usually does teach a lot of lessons. All of us know people who ought to know better, people who have forgotten, as this points out. The lessons they are learned in their youth, they shouldn't be repeating them. 
Here was a king who had once gone from prison to prison, or from prison to the throne because he understood life. He had been poor and he was exalted to a position of power. But he had forgotten all the lessons that he had learned. The searcher's second argument is that even the wise youth will go on to repeat the same error in verses 15 and 16, where it says, I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before him, but those who came later were not pleased with the successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Here's your young man who went through the same difficulties, who had won his way to popularity and power, yet he didn't learn the lessons either. Although he had the example of his predecessor, he ultimately lost the respect of others. So even old age, even time, doesn't always teach us these lessons. It all remains yet vanity, emptiness, and striving after the wind. In chapter 5, which is a marvelous chapter, the searcher answers these, uh, ob he answers these objections in a wonderful way. There are four things of which he declares here. First, in verse 1a, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. You know, we have to learn to let God be God. That's the first thing he declares to us. The lessons of life will fall into place when you learn that. God is in charge of life. Let him be in charge. Take these lessons from his hands. The place we learn that is in the house of God. When you go there, guard your steps. Or in other words, enter thoughtfully. Expect to be taught something. In ancient Israel, of course, the house of God was the temple in Jerusalem. We have the church, and it's wherever we meet. Sacrifices were offered there, and explanation was made to the people as what they meant. The law was read, and the wisdom of God about life was given to the people. The Old Testament was unfolded, and its tremendous insights to the truth about life, about what humanity basically and fundamentally is. The temple was the only place in the land where people could learn these things. In our day, the house of God is no longer a building. We have to be clear about that. We, the people, are the house of God. What the searcher is saying is that when you gather together as a people of God, be expectant. There is something to be learned. You know, whenever I hear or read the word, I'm either taught something or reminded something through of something through conviction in my heart. That happens a lot. Romans 10, 16 through 17 says, but not, all, but not all Israel has accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through word about Christ. It is where our faith comes from, our saving faith. But something else is needed, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit to give the hearer faith. As Christians, it's our job to speak the word about Christ to others so others can hear, and the Holy Spirit takes it from there. Secondly, he says, listen carefully in verse 1b, where it says, go near and listen, rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know they do wrong. You know, a fool is somebody who glibly utters naive, ingenious, and usually false things. What the searcher clearly has in mind here is our tendency to complain and murmur about what has been handed to us in life. When we gripe and grouse about the circumstances, we are really complaining against God. We are complaining about the choice God has made in his wonderful plan for our life. You know, we'll, we'll never learn to enjoy anything that way, not even our pleasures, let alone our pain. 
So he says, listen carefully. For among the people of God, the truth of God is being declared. The wisdom of God is being set forth. And then he continues in verses 2 and 3. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. You know, almost everybody takes the phrase, God, in, God is in heaven to mean that God is off somewhere or high above the universe watching the affairs of men while we insignificant pygmies here struggle along. But that's not what this is saying at all. Heaven isn't some distant place in the Bible. In the Bible, heaven always means the invisible word of re world of reality. What is going on that we can't see, but yet is really there? God is in that realm, and that's why he sees much more than we do. In John 1, or 1 John 3.20, it said, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. You know, there's no way that I can understand the complexity and depth of the struggle that many of you are, many of you are going through now. But God does. God not only sees you, he sees what is inside of you, what even you can't see. He sees your heredity, your environment, your struggles. He sees every one of us that way. Remember that when you're dealing with God, when he speaks to you through his word, that, that word is so much more true than anything you can come up as an explanation of life because God sees all of, all, all of life from beginning to end. He is in heaven and you on earth. For so heaven's sake, don't start driving about God is handing you. Hand, is handed you. That's the searcher's argument here. The saints have had to learn this lesson from time immemorial. It's reflected in a hymn by William Cal Cowper, who was an 18th, 18th century hymnist. Now I'll read you his hymn here. God moves in a mysterious way. He won his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-ending skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Your fearful, your fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you do you so much dread are big with mercies and shall break and blessings on your head. God is in heaven and you upon earth, therefore let your words be few. The searcher says, for a dream comes with much business. But by this, he means fantasies. And fantasizing produces much activity, but in reality, it accomplishes nothing. So also a fool with his many words of complaint accomplishes nothing. Secondly, he says, don't play games with God in verse 4. Verse 4, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow now. You know, God's a realist. He never plays games with us. He sees things the way they really are, and he tells us the way they are. He expects us to carry out our word. It's dangerous to make superficial promises about what we are going to do if he will only do this or that. We can't bargain with him. He hears our promises. He takes us at his word. There is a penalty when we don't keep it. You know, this ought to teach us to be more careful about the promises we make to God. Don't do that. For he is not pleased with fools. 
In fact, the searcher goes on to say here in verse verses 5a, 5 through 6a, it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Then in verses 6b through 7, why should God be ang angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. You're dealing with the author of life itself here. He holds your existence in the palm of his hand, and God isn't cruel and heartless. He's loving. But he is real, so don't play games with him. Be honest with God. That's all the searcher is saying here. So pay attention when you're hearing the words of God. Listen as he describes life to you. He's telling you so that you might find enjoyment in all that you do. Thirdly, value government. It too is from God in verses 8 and 9, where it says, If you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one. And over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. The argument is really simple. Don't be astonished and bitter. God has set up a higher official who may correct oppression when they come, when they become aware of it. But even if they don't, there is still one higher. He is aware. He knows what he's doing. Recognize that there is good in government. You know, someone once said, even bad government is better than no government at all. Romans 13 gives us the definitive New Testament teaching on the place and purpose of civil government. Paul, Paul begins by telling us everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities because these have been established by God. We can't live in anarchy. Even the worst kind of government is better than no government at all. Value that. It will help in dealing with the problems of life. Just accept it. Then the searcher takes it for a circumstance here. Most people feel that if they could only get rich, they could handle the pressures of the problems of life. This section runs from verses 10 through 17. In verse 10 it says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever has wealth is never satisfied in their income. This too is meaningless. First, money won't satisfy you. Money won't leave you feeling full and enjoying life. There is plenty of testimony of that today. We've already studied about all the celebrities that have made so much money and then they were lost to suicide because they weren't left, they were left without meaning in their lives. They have accomplished so much, but it doesn't give satisfaction. Secondly, in verse 11, it says, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? That's what we're talking about here. You'll soon discover that the crowd of parasites gather around you wanting to spend your money for you. You get nothing out of them but more expense. He develops this even further in verse 12 where it says, The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. <laughs> You know, the second advantage to having money is that you, disadvantage, I should say, is that you worry about how to take care of your property. You stay awake at nights worrying about how to sleep or how to keep what you have. There's still a third advantage in verses 13 and 14. It says, I have seen a, a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded, 
to the harm of its owners or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when they have children there is nothing left for them to inherit. You know, you can lose all of your riches. They disappear overnight. A turn of the wheel, a drop of the Dow Jones averages and your fortune is gone. Finally, riches don't survive death, but you will in verses 15 through 17 where it says, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil, as everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness and great frustration, frustration affliction, and anger. You know, you can't, or you can, take absolutely nothing away from you, away with you. Life is empty and meaningless for so many people. You know, they suffer what I call destination sickness. Having arrived at where they always wanted to be and having everything that they always wanted to have in life, they don't want anything that they have. So once again, we come to the true answer with the closing words of the chapter in verses 18 through 19, where it says, This is what I have observed to be good. That is the appropriate, that it, it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and positions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their toil, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. In other words, enjoyment doesn't come from possessions or from riches, nor does it come from companionship, from popularity and fame, from the approval of the admir of admirers, or the admiration of others. Enjoyment comes by knowing the living God and taking everything from His hand with thanksgiving, whether it be pain or pleasure. That is the gift of God and that is the lesson of this great book. Notice how, chapter, how the chapter closes in verse 20. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness in their heart. Have you ever met people like that? They have lived a full life, but they never talk about the past. Some people live in the past. William Randolph Hearst, who amassed one of the greatest fortunes of our time, ended his days amidst the opulence and splendor of the castle which he built in Southern California. I've turned that castle. He was sitting in a basement playing over and over again the movies of his paramour from Hollywood in an effort to eke out a degree of enjoyment from the past. It's sad. You know, when people have discovered the richness of life which God has provided, they don't think much about the past or even talk about it. They don't talk about the future because they were so richly involved with the Savior, with the, with the Savior of life right now. I once heard one of the elders in this church say, I am a happy man. It was a sermon that he was giving. He has entered his twilight years and he has lived life well. That's an example of this. I'm a happy man. How good it is to know the living God, to know that He controls what comes into your life. He expects you to make choices. Scripture always encourages that. But rejoice in the wisdom of a father's heart. I richly enjoy what is handed to you day by day. That is the secret of life.
A person like this won't much remember the days of his life because God will keep him occupied with joy in his heart. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that you give us. We remember the words of Jesus, Lord, when he said to his disciple on the black dark day of his own betrayal and crucifixion, my joy I leave with you. A joy which the world can't give, Lord, but he leaves it. For us, as we pray, we may discover that joy in the midst of life as you have provided it for us in Jesus our Lord. And we pray that in his name. Amen. Thank you, beloved. I'll see you next Wednesday.